All right, everybody. So uh, can everybody hear me? Because I know I'm not a loud speaker. OK. Um, well, thank you for sticking around for my talk. I'm sorry I couldn't make it here this morning. Um, but United happened. Um, <laughs> uh, special thanks to Carmen for working with me through everything uh, via email. So I'm here to talk about the state of Node Core. Um, my name is Colin Erig. I am a, an engineer at Joyent, where I do things like work on Node and work on LibUV. And first, let's start with Node.js is 10 years old. Um, we won't sing right now, but happy birthday, Node. Another thing that just was announced today, so I was able to add this slide because I wasn't here in the morning, is Node has a new, uh, two new certification programs. Uh, one is the Node.js developer, application developer certification. Uh, that's more focused on you know, general knowledge of Node. Uh, I would say it's, it, it sounds more to me like the beginner Node certification. And then there's the Node.js services developer certification, which is, I think, a little more rigorous. It's uh, for people who want to build services, and it has an emphasis on security. Uh, I know people have different opinions about these certifications, whether they're good or not, or useful. I'm not here to push them on you, uh, but they are $300, and you get a uh, free retake if you don't pass on your first try. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, so moving on, Node is still popular. Um, this is taken from metrics, or nodejs.org slash metrics. It's kind of uh, an indicator of downloads per day and also the number of megabytes downloaded per day. They mirror each other because you know, when you download Node once, you get the same number of megabytes if you're downloading the same version. <clears throat> but uh, you know, year over year, we're still seeing growth of about 40%. Uh, that has slowed down uh, you know, over the past few years, but you can only, there's only so many developers. You can only get so big, and 40% is still good. Uh, next, I wanted to briefly just touch on the NPM ecosystem health. So not directly related to Node Core, but still really important. Uh, I put as many package managers on here from modulecounts.com as would fit uh, without you know, kind of throwing off the graph. And the big one with the red arrow that's pointing to a million, that's NPM. Um, it's the only one that's that big. Uh, I don't know what happened with modulecounts.com where it looks like it hit an infinite slope for a second there, but you can, you can go to NPM and verify the numbers. They, they are over well over a million now. Um, if you take home anything from this talk, this is probably the slide that you want to focus on. This is the Node.js long-term support plan. So this kind of this is always available at Node.js or GitHub.com slash Node.js slash release. You can see this data, this chart, and then also similar data um, in a tabular fashion. But this basically will show you over time which branches are are you know available to use and what their current status is. So at the very top in the yellow we have the master branch. This is where all of Node's development happens on a daily basis, commits, you know, land every single day. Probably not what you want to run in production. Um, things, you know, things break, there are regressions. Uh, but then back in around 2015, uh, around the same time as the, the Node Foundation coming together and the whole IOJS fork, uh, we kind of realized that we needed to strike a balance between moving as fast as possible and getting all the new features because that's what developers like and also having some sense of stability because that's what enterprises kind of rely on. Um, and so what we came away with was every April and October we will cut a new Semver major release. So for example in October of this year we cut Node 13. Uh, that happened today by the way. Um, the even numbered releases, so like 12 came out back in April, and then the odd releases come out in October. Each Semver major release becomes what's called the, the current branch for six months. Um, after those six months, the odd numbered branches go into a brief maintenance period and then just kind of die off. Uh, the even numbered ones, which are much more interesting, they go into what is called active LTS. So during active LTS, they still get some fixes that come from master uh, or from current, um, but not everything and not as frequently. So typically things have to 
to prove that they are stable inside of the current branch before they can be backported to LTS. And that's really good for stability purposes because it keeps bugs from kind of leaking in. Um, so the active LTS brand or active LTS period, which is shown in blue, up until and up until and including node 10 was 18 months long. And starting with node 12, that's being dropped down to 12 months. Uh, the reason for that is we have a small team of people who are in charge of backporting all these commits. And you know, over the course of 18 months, it's more commits and also the delta between what's in the current release and what's going into LTS gets bigger so it becomes more work for them. So that period has gone down by six months. Now after active LTS, it goes into something called maintenance mode, which is shown in gray up here. Uh, maintenance mode means it's basically getting, you know, even fewer patches are being backported. It's mostly reserved for things like uh, high priority fixes or security bugs. Um, with node 10 and earlier, this was a period of 12 months. Um, starting with node 12, we've moved that up to 18 months. So we took the six months off of active LTS, moved it onto maintenance mode. It's less work for the backporting team because not as many things are getting backported. Uh, so one of the release lines that's active right now is node 8. Um, is anybody in here using node 8 still? All right, cool. Um, so each LTS uh, branch gets a, a code name that's based off of the periodic table. Um, people kind of argue back and forth of how useful the, the names are and also the fact that not every element or not every letter has a corresponding element. So who knows if these will stick around forever, but node 8 is currently known also as carbon. So if you see the, the two names, they're interchangeable. Uh, the end of life for that is going to be December of this year. Now, normally, end of life comes in April, so it should be April 2020, but Node 8 ships with a version of OpenSSL, which handles things like you know, crypto and things like that, things that you don't want to be out of date on. Uh, that version that ships with Node 8 actually goes end of life at the end of December. So instead of continuing on with Node 8 with a you know, unsecure version of OpenSSL, we decided to just bump up the end of life for Node 8 there. So if you're still using it, you should, if you haven't migrated, you should you know, start migrating now. Uh, definitely want to be done with that by the end of December. Um, one, one group of people that this will impact are FIPS users. I, I'm not exactly sure how common FIPS is out there. I know from my day job that we've had multiple companies reach out to us asking for support beyond the end of, the end of life of Node 8 uh, because they're using FIPS. So FIPS stands for the Federal Information Processing Standards. It's a set of crypto standards that apply to US non-military government agencies. Um, not, you know, most, I've, I've never used it personally myself, but I know that there are people out there using it. Uh, Node doesn't ship a, a FIPS version, so basically you have to compile that from scratch yourself. You need to go out and get the OpenSSL FIPS module, build Node, and then uh, pass in some command line flags to actually enable FIPS. Uh, so Node 8 currently does have FIPS, but Node 10 and 12 do not. Uh, I'm not including any of the odd numbered releases because you shouldn't really use those in production. Um, Node 14 might have support for it, but it's still kind of up in the air. It all depends on when OpenSSL 3 ships and when it gets included in a version of Node. So if, if you are a FIPS user, just something to kind of have a heads up on. Uh, then the next release branch that's currently active is Node 10. So the code name for this one is Dubnium. Uh, it's currently an active LTS, and honestly, it's, I think, doing pretty well. This is what I would personally recommend for using in production right now. Uh, very stable. There was just another release today, but it, you know, for the most part, it's uneventful, and that's what you want out of your LTS releases. Uh, Node 12 did go into active LTS as of yesterday, so what that means is there are going to be more people adopting it, and there's a good chance that it'll shake out some more bugs. So I would personally you know, wait another release or two before adopting Node 12. Uh, but I'm conservative like that, I guess. And then next up comes Node 12. So originally released earlier this year in April, uh, went into active LTS yesterday, as I said. Um, it has the code name Erbium, which I didn't even know was an element until Node 12 got that name. Uh, it'll be 
active LTS until October of next year under our, our restructured LTS schedule. And then it'll go end of life in April of 2022. So once you do get onto Node 12, you should be in pretty good shape for you know, a couple years to come. Uh, the majority of features that I'm gonna talk about now are things that came into Node 12 because you know, Node 13 just came out today and Node 12 is kind of the, the most interesting one to talk about at this point. Uh, if you went to Rich's talk earlier, you might have heard about workers. They're now stable, so you know, use them, play around with them, enjoy them. Uh, we also have a new HTTP, HTTP parser by default. It's LLHTTP. Um, so it showed up in 11.2 and uh, was still, it was something you could use, but it wasn't the default. Uh, starting with Node 12, we've now made that the default. And then in Node 13, the old HTTP parser has gone away. Uh, more progress on ES modules. So you can still use them. They're still behind a flag. They're not stable yet. Uh, I believe the plan is to try to unflag them within Node 12, but I don't wanna make any guarantees there. We've also bumped up the maximum size of the libuv thread pool. Um, most, most average users don't have a need to customize the libuv thread pool, but if you do, uh, that, that upper limit is now 1,024. Previously, it was 128. Uh, I guess, you know, as computers continue to evolve, you have more threads that you can utilize now. Um, and then another interesting kind of function that was added to core was process.resource usage. Um, so we had this functionality inside of libuv, which is the, the platform abstraction C library that Node sits on top of. Uh, we had the ability to get all these interesting uh, resource statistics like, you know, numbers about page faults, uh, uh, CPU, uh, CPU time and things of that nature. So all kinds of good stuff. Uh, that finally has been exposed inside of Node, so you have access to that now. Um, fs.writev is another uh, feature that I think is pretty cool. So you know, if you've ever used the fs open, fs write, and fs close family of functions, uh, previously with fs write you could only do a single buffer at a time. Now you're able to send an entire array of of array buffers into uh, into, you know, into libuv to be written at one time. So that's you know good. It, it eliminates kind of the round trip between JavaScript and C and C++, which can really slow you down. So if it's something that you need to do, I recommend using that over fs.write. Uh, we've also implemented smarter heat lim heap limits inside of V8. So uh, V8 is kind of designed you know, to work with Chrome and in the browser use case. Uh, and it sets the, the JavaScript heap size to be, you know, I don't wanna say pretty low, but for, for some use cases on the server it is low. Uh, to about one and a half gigs on 64-bit machines and only half of that on 32-bit machines. And you know, all along we've had the ability to kind of override that if we wanted to with the dash dash max old space size flag, which lets you, it's not the most intuitive name for a flag, but it lets you set the size of the JavaScript heap. Um, but in recent versions of Node, we added, we added something called uh, UV get constrained memory, which basically will let you ask the operating system how much memory you can use, and this can be different from the total amount of memory available. Uh, so things like Linux C groups can actually impose an artificial memory limit on you. Um, and it, so if you were to try to set the heap size to the total memory size of the machine, you just wouldn't have access to that and you'd crash. So we have this new uh, constrained memory upper limit that we can set. Um, if there isn't an, uh, an operating system imposed constraint, then we do just default back to what the total memory size is. Um, so that's you know, much more efficient use of memory and less need to customize things if you have you know, memory intensive workloads. Another feature that's been asked for for years is uh, recursive uh, uh, removal of directories, um, sometimes called RIMRAF. Uh, we actually took the existing RIMRAF package off of NPM, basically ported it into, into core. We dropped some things like it, it, you know, the NPM package supports globs and things like that. Um, it would have been a lot of overhead to actually drag all of that stuff into core too, so that, that was kind of left out. Um, and so people have been wanting this for a long time now. They've actually tried to implement it several times, uh, e including in the C++ layer. And uh, what we actually found was implementing it in C++ was slower than the JavaScript package. The reason for that is 
Uh, RimWrath is kind of a, a parallel operation, so you can actually you know, just start kicking off a bunch of delete operations at the same time. And the C++ implementation basically serialized all that, so it, it slowed things down. Um, so that's why we decided to go with the NPM package that you know, kind of proved itself. It's faster and has what, 19 million weekly downloads. And the way we decided to implement it, ex you know, expose it as an API, is we added a recursive flag to the uh, rmdir function. Uh, the reason we decided to go with that approach is because, you know, a year or so ago, we also added recursive makedir. So we wanted to have, you know, parity between the two APIs. So I've included examples here of what the, the three different ways to call RimRAF are. Uh, what the first one is going to be the, you know, kind of legacy callback-based approach. Um, and then we have the, the synchronous approach, which is really useful if you're doing things like in, in CLI tools and things of that nature. And then, you know, I don't know if people, you know, I think a lot of people know now, but the FS module has a promise-based implementation. Uh, so this is what the, the promises-based one's going to look like at the very bottom. We also added streaming reader. So this was something that has been also asked for for years. Um, the thing that was blocking it was support in libuv because it's a file system operation. So the problem with the existing FS reader is that it reads all the entries in the directory at once and gives you back the results. Um, if you're trying to do that with very large directories, that's not going to work well for you. So we had a couple people take a crack at it inside of libuv. There was a pull request that changed hands probably, I don't know, three or four times. Um, and I think people just kept giving up on it. So we, we finally got that over the finish line. Um, we got it, we were able to add it without breaking ABI compatibility in LibUV, which was another kind of challenging point there. Um, and then in Node 12.12, we shipped it. Um, and like the previous example, it has callback-based, synchronous, and promises-based implementations. And so this is what, this is an example of what the code is going to look like. Uh, I decided to go with the, the promises-based one because async await is, you know, more popular and also a little easier to put onto slides. Uh, so I had to put it inside of an async function because top-level await's not there quite yet. Uh, but you would call fs.opender and you pass in the name of a directory and it'll give you back a handle to that, you know, directory iter uh, iterator. And so the first thing I'm doing is printing out the, the name of the path that we're reading. So uh, dir.path is going to be the same as uh, underscore underscore dir name. And then you can actually uh, asynchronously loop over the contents of that and print out all of the files that are in the directory. So it's a, a nice usability thing and also you know, really important for people who were unable to, unable to get the job done with the existing FS read dir. Uh, we've also added readable.from, so you can basically now create a readable stream from any iterable object inside a node. Um, the example here just takes a basic string, ABC, and turns it into a readable stream. So now, um, I, again, I use the for await syntax to kind of loop over it, but you could do the same thing with like uh, listening for data and end events, kind of the legacy uh, event handlers. Um, but yeah, so this will actually print out one by one each character because that's how you would iterate over a string. So that's a, another nice usability uh, feature. There's also been a whole lot of work done on improving Node diagnostics because for years that was one of the top complaints about Node was it's really hard to get you know, useful debugging information out of Node. So a few years ago, uh, the V8 team was kind enough to expose uh, Chrome's dev tools inside of Node. Um, and you could go in there and you could, you know, manually click around and create a CPU profile or, you know, debug your code, anything like that. But f especially for servers, it was kind of a, a clunky operation because you had to go in and manually start profiling and then turn on something to apply load to your server and it just, it, it wasn't a fun thing. Um, so we added some flags to make that easier. So now you can actually pass in dash dash CPU prof and that will uh, start up the CPU profiler and then when the process ends it'll write out a CPU profile uh, to file for you. And then by default it's going to write out to the current directory with a unique file name that's based on the date and some atomic sequence number. Um, you can configure where it gets where it gets written to with the dash dash CPU prof dir and CPU prof name flags. Uh, so you can, can you know you can specify which directory you want to write it to as well as what you want the file name to be. And the CPU profiler by default uh, 
it samples your application every millisecond. Um, so you can actually uh, use the CPU prof interval to configure that if you really need to. Uh, and then you still have the option to go in and do all this by hand. And I don't want to spend too much time on this slide, but basically the same thing applies to memory profiling. So you, you, know, you can now profile uh, heap activity, see where allocations are happening, things like that. It's good for debugging like you know, where allocations are happening in your application. Again, you can, you can do all this through uh, dev tools, but it's just a little nicer to do it with, with the flags. And then uh, heap, heap, heap snapshots, uh, the experience there got better as well. So has anybody here ever used heap snapshots to debug a memory leak? Um, okay, cool. So uh, basically what you wanna do is you'll take a snapshot of your entire JavaScript heap and it'll show you all the objects in it. And then you wait some time later and you take another snapshot and then the dev tools actually have a comparison view where you can see what the differences between those two are. So you can see new objects that have been allocated and you know, objects that have been freed. And it's a really good way for you to try to figure out you know, where your memory leaks are coming from. Um, unfortunately, in the past, what you usually had to do was install the node heap dump module and then go into your code, modify it to add a signal handler so you could you know, create some type of trigger to create these snapshots. Um, so all of that is now available to you out of the box. Uh, you just use the dash dash heap, sna heap snapshot signal uh, command line flag. Um, so for example, you would start your application with node dash dash heap snapshot signal sig user two. Uh, start your server and then you can use the kill command from the command line at, at any point in time to send a signal and you'll get a, a new heap snapshot and then you can you know, look at them offline and, and try to see what's going on. Um, a really big one that we just got recently, even though it's still in experimental mode, are uh, diagnostic reports. Uh, these are basically like, uh, if you've ever worked with post-mortem debugging or core files, it's like a lighter weight version of that. Um, so post-mortem debugging is a little bit of a pain to get started with. You have to kind of set up your machines to capture core files. You have to use these special tools like LL Node uh, to, to analyze them. The tools are always out of date because they depend on the internals of V8. So it's, they're very powerful, but it's not a, a very nice user experience. Um, so with uh, diagnostic reports, you can kind of think of it as a lightweight version of that. You get a whole bunch of stuff for free in like a human readable format. Things like you know, what's going on inside of LibUV, information about the machine, information about the, the process. Um, if there's an error, you get like stack traces. You can see the C++ and JavaScript stack. So really useful stuff. Um, I, I recommend if you're running Node in production to, to start playing around with this. It is still experimental, but it's not something, you know, this is something that's probably, you're probably gonna use whenever your application is already crashing. So even if it does cause problems, you're not gonna really, you know, miss out on much. Uh, and then we introduced a set of flags for working with those. So the dash dash experimental report flag, because it is still an experimental feature, you have to use that to turn it on. Um, and then report on fatal error is used if you wanna uh, basically generate a diagnostic report whenever there's a C++ error like uh, node itself crashes. Um, you can use uh, report on signal to, to re create a diagnostic report uh, whenever you send a signal to the process and then you would use the report signal flag to say what you want that signal to be. By default, it's gonna be SIG user two, which is uh, not available to Windows users, sorry. Um, and then you use the report directory and report file name to configure where you wanna dump these reports to. Um, again, it's gonna be the same the same as what I said before, it's gonna dump the report into the current directory with a unique file name. If you want a, a, a prettier file name, then you would use that. Um, I skipped over report uncaught exception. That's gonna be if you wanna create a diagnostic report on a JavaScript uncaught exception. So I think that's probably the one most people would be interested in. And then I, I don't know how well the people in the back can see this. This is a, uh, a bit of a diagnostic report. Um, it includes things like you know, what command line flags were passed into Node, uh, the, the PID, the versions of all your dependencies, um, basically things that, you know, if you come to report an error with Node, you could attach one of these things and say, here's my diagnostic report, and that'll give, you know, whoever's trying to figure out the problem a much better idea of, of what was going on at the time of the crash. Um, we've also added TLS tracing, which is an interesting feature that comes from OpenSSL. So, 
we'll get bug reports in Node a lot of times of uh, my machine or my connection works fine, but as soon as I start trying to talk over TLS, uh, it doesn't work, and I don't know why. And the the advice used to be, well, you know, use this this arbitrary open SSL command line utility that I don't think you know many people, especially JavaScript developers, know about. Um, so now you can actually just, instead of trying to do this and losing the context of your application, you can just pass in the dash dash trace TLS flag to Node, and it'll dump out all of the same information right in the context of your Node process. Um, so it you know, makes it a lot easier to get the information that you're looking for and also better bug reports. And that's configurable at the entire process level, or you can do it on individual sockets, or you can set it on a server object so that you know, each individual server socket gets that as well. So that, that's a nice little feature, I think. Um, we've also improved, well, not improved unhandled rejections, but handled, uh, improved the way that you can deal with unhandled rejections. So promises are more or less designed for use in the browser. Um, their behavior doesn't really mesh well with server applications. If you have an unhandled rejection in the server and you know you were in the process of reading a file, uh, the default behavior is to just you know, swallow that rejection, and that can lead to things like file descriptor leaks and other nasty things that you probably don't want to debug. Uh, so we now have the dash dash unhandled rejections flag that takes uh, three different modes of operation. So you can pass in strict, which is the one that I prefer in servers, uh, which will basically turn your unhandled rejection into thrown exceptions. Uh, that one's a nice one because if you're already using an unhandled rejection workflow, then it just kind of uh, meshes well together. If you don't want to go that far and start throwing exceptions, you can just warn about them. So that's what the, the warn option does. And then if you are okay with just swallowing all the unhandled rejections, you can pass in none. Um, at that point, I'm not really sure why you would be using this flag at all, though. Uh, so a quick example, just a one-liner, promise reject. Uh, by default, this would do nothing, although Node does have that annoying uh, error message that I'm sure a lot of people have seen talking about in the future, this is gonna be deprecated and we'll throw an exception or something along those lines. Uh, people who are fans of promises really hate that one. Um, but in this case, we're starting up Node with the dash dash unhandled rejections equals strict. So in, uh, whenever we get the unhandled rejection, you see you actually get a, a nice thrown exception with a stack trace. Um, and I don't know if you can tell from the screen or not, this line is gonna be black. Uh, this is a new feature in, in modern versions of Node. That's going indi to indicate something that's coming from your application. And then all of these lines down here are gray. Those are going to be things that are coming from like Node Core and things that aren't your application. So it's just a, a little bit of a usability thing to help you identify you know, where the problems are. Uh, we've also added experimental WASM modules. So if you're a fan of WebAssembly, uh, WebAssembly modules, you know, in, using them inside your code is usually a multiple step process, so you have to somehow get the WASM bytecode into your application, whether that's reading it from a file or something else. Um, then you can optionally compile it into a module, or you can just skip straight to instantiating it. Um, but it's, you know, always at least one or two steps. Uh, starting in node 12.3, you can actually just import them directly, and this is what that looks like inside of an ES module. So you have to start up Node with the dash dash experimental modules flag and the dash dash experimental WASM modules flag. Uh, this example kind of implies that your WASM module has an export named add to, which will take two numbers and add them together. Um, so it's that easy. Uh, if you still prefer common JS modules like I do, uh, you can still do the same thing. You have to use the uh, dynamic import feature. So you know, wrap everything inside of an async function and then await import and then the same WASM file and it works inside of common JS, which is really cool. Uh, we've also picked up a number of useful uh, features from V8 itself. So one of them is no or low cost asynchronous stack traces. I have a little asterisk next to that because I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Uh, Promise.allsettled is a new language feature. Uh, it'll wait until every, you know, you pass it in a bunch of, of uh, promises, it waits until all of them have settled, either, you know, rejected or resolved in some way. Uh, we've got private class fields now. I know some people are, aren't a fan of that, but they're there. Uh, numeric separators, 
this is kind of a, a readability thing for your code. So if you were trying to write the number, you know, one million instead of one followed by a bunch of zeros, you can actually put like an underscore in between the zeros to make it more readable. Um, and then we have JITless execution. So this is really useful for environments like iOS. Uh, a lot of people have noticed there's not really Node on iOS. The reason for that is Apple does not want to let people who aren't Apple uh, write to executable memory. Uh, so the, the team at V8 figured out a way to just turn off their JIT feature and kind of work without it. Um, so you can now run it on iOS. Not, I'm not saying we distribute Node for iOS, but it's more of an option now. Um, but then coming back to the asynchronous stack traces for a minute. So I'm sure anyone that's been using Node for any amount of time has seen a stack trace that included an asynchronous operation and halfway through the stack trace you just completely lose all context of what was going on. Uh, the reason for that is when you're calling these functions, you're building up the stack and then you queue up some asynchronous operation to, ha to happen later and then things start popping back off the execution stack so that whenever your asynchronous code runs, you, uh, it no longer has any context of what was on the stack before. Um, and in the past, we solved that with NPM modules like Long John, which would actually uh, keep a lot of internal state and then be able to stitch these asynchronous stack traces back together for you. The problem with that approach was that it had a lot of overhead, so you couldn't really use it in production. Uh, V8 can now create these asynchronous stack traces some of the time. So it's automatic and has no overhead, but it only applies to async await code. Um, and from my own personal testing with it, it seems like it sometimes add, like causes you to have to add more await statements than would normally be necessary. I don't know if that's a bug or a feature, but I'll have an example here in a second. So this is, code, this is asynchronous code from node 10. So what's going on here is we're calling foo, and then from inside of foo, we're asynchronously calling bar, and then bar is gonna throw an exception. And if you look at the stack trace, you see bar, but there is no, no, no trace of foo anywhere. Now, the same code running inside of node 12, uh, if you see the red arrow at the bottom, it now, it now is able to give you that stack trace. It points out you know, asynchronous uh, function foo. So that's cool and all, but if you notice up inside of foo, it says return await bar. Now, uh, if anyone's using ESLint, with, they, have a, they actually have a rule that prohibits this because bar is returning a promise. So you're awaiting the promise and then returning a promise again from another asynchronous function. So it's extra work that doesn't really make sense. But if you go and you actually remove that extra await, so now you can see here I've just gone back to returning bar. This is still perfectly valid JavaScript. You'll still get the, ex the result that you expect. Um, but if you look at the bottom, we're back to the same less useful stack trace. Um, I posted something on Twitter to the V8 team and didn't hear anything back. So I guess you know, we're on our own. But if, if you're using ESLint's no return await rule, that's something to at least be cognizant of. Um, and then moving on to node 13, which was released today, yay. Um, it was released today, it's gonna be the current release until April of next year. Then there'll be a short maintenance period. It'll probably be end of life sometime around June. Uh, if you're thinking about using it in production, you probably shouldn't. Um, and we will go into why that is in a little bit. Um, but there are some notable changes in it. Uh, I, I always say that Semver major changes should be boring if you're doing it right. Otherwise, you know, all of the new features come in Semver minor changes. Um, and if so, if your Semver major changes are exciting, then you probably broke a lot of stuff. Um, so, you know, whenever you're going to upgrade, you should still make sure you're running your tests. Uh, you know, make sure that the change log looks okay to you. Just you do your due diligence to make sure that it works. One feature that changed that's not really breaking and is actually really exciting is we now have full ICU by default. Uh, so up until this point, we had internationalization, but it was only enabled for English. Um, so now there's you know dozens or I think maybe even hundreds of, of locales that are enabled by default. It does make the size of the binary go up a little bit, but it's worth it. Um, we've upgraded to V8 7.8. Not a whole lot to say about that one. Um, we've improved Python 3 support, so Christian Klaus, who I believe works at IBM, um, has basically taken this task on mostly by himself. Uh, Node 
in, like itself works a lot with Python under the hood, um, like to build things and compiled add-ons do a lot of things with Python. And you know, up until this point, it was Python 2. Python 2 is also going to be end of life at the end of this year, so it was time to really get some Python 3 support in there. Um, I'm pretty sure that the way it works now is if you have a system with Python 2 and 3, it'll still choose to use Python 2, but if you only have Python 3, it should work with that now. Um, and then other notable changes are just you know normal housekeeping things like moving old APIs that are going through the deprecation process, either moving them forward a little bit or removing them completely. Um, so you know it does have the potential to break your code, but we, we try really hard not to do that. Uh, some more things like setting process.emv.tz. Uh, internally, we have a time zone cache, and it always caused a lot of people confusion of why it worked the way it did. So now if you set that to, ch to actually change your application's time zone, it completely wipes out that cache and you know, should work a little bit better. Um, errors, we, we would attach a dot, uh, .errno field to it. Uh, some of those were, they were supposed to all be numeric, but some of them were strings. It caused people confusion and then they had to you know, manually go in and try to do the translation from string to number. So uh, just, you know, it's a breaking change, but it should actually in the long run be better for users. Uh, the HTTP host header, so we do some processing of that header internally inside of Node, and it would cause problems if people would pass in a host header that wasn't a string. Um, so now it will throw if it's not a string instead of crashing. Um, and then there used to be a default socket timeout on HTTP2 and HTT HTTP and HTTP2 uh, server sockets. Uh, Node was kind of an oddball in that we did that. Uh, we realized that and have gotten rid of that. So if you were relying on that functionality in the past, you will probably have to update your code. So this really messy graph from uh, Node.js org slash metrics shows basically usage over time of all the different versions. Uh, two important trends to look at, uh, the dark blue and bright blue. I don't know if, yeah, they, they don't show up quite that well on, on the projector. But the, the two release lines that are kind of trending up are node 10 and node 12, and that's as expected and what it should be. The, the larger one that's in black and is starting to trend down along with all the other ones, that's node 8. Uh, so that basically that's telling us that all the other release lines are starting to die off, which is also what we want. Now, a lot of people ask, you know, what, do they, what version of node should they run in production? And it, it basically comes down to, we recommend always, always running an LTS version in production. Um, there are you know, some brave souls out there who are living, you know, willing to live on kind of the bleeding edge, but if you're gonna live on the bleeding edge, you should expect blood. Uh, if, if you can't update your, your node distribution easily and frequently, then you definitely don't wanna be on the current release line. Uh, there are regressions that come out. Uh, I don't wanna say frequently, but they do happen. Here are some examples of them. So going back to you know, some in Node 8 and then some more recent ones in Node 12. Uh, I'm not gonna go through them all individually, but they're, they're just minor things like breaking all uh, native add-ons and causing NPM to not work and not being able to compile the official Node.js source tarball. So just, just little things, but, uh, but this is why you don't wanna work on the current you don't want to run the current branch in production because none of these things actually made it back to LTS due to the way our, our process is set up. Um, I, I want to take a minute to talk about the state of testing in Node. So this is a big thing as far as stability goes. Uh, we have nearly 2,800 tests that run on every single commit into Node. Uh, these tests run in our CI and it covers Linux, Mac OS, Windows, ARM, like a whole variety of operating systems. Um, I don't know if you can read it at the bottom, but we have coverage.nodejs.org, which shows JavaScript code coverage and C++ code coverage. Both have been trending up for some time now, so we're up to about 97% code coverage in our JavaScript code, so I think that's pretty good, especially considering our code, bot, our code base is constantly getting bigger as we add new things like, you know, HTTP2 was a big dependency that brought in a whole native ng HTTP to uh, C++ dependency. So the fact that these things are still trending up, I think is really good. 
And when I was preparing this, this presentation, I went back and looked at a similar one that I made about two and a half years ago. And at the time, uh, code coverage was, I think, around 92 or 93 percent in JavaScript. And we only had 1,400 unit tests. So um, there's been a lot of work there. And uh, props to Rich, because he actually does a lot of it. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about some potential features that we have coming down. Uh, so one that I'm really excited about, and hopefully we'll get into Node, uh, none of these are actually guaranteed, is the WebAssembly system interface. So uh, when you run WebAssembly, it, it runs inside of a sandbox and has no access to the underlying file system, kind of like JavaScript in the browser. Um, last year, Mozilla and some other people announced this uh, WASI, um, which would basically give it an API that allows WebAssembly to talk to the underlying platform. Um, as somebody who works on LibUV, which kind of does the same thing for Node, that excited me a little bit, so I've been playing around with that. Um, if you're interested in, in looking at the progress at all, there is a repo. It's uh, Node.js uh, slash WASI on GitHub. Uh, Quick and HTTP3 is another one that James Snell has been working on. Uh, so James is the, uh, the one that did a lot of the heavy lifting getting HTTP2 into Node Core. Uh, He's done HTTP plus plus and is now working on HTTP three. Uh, that one also has a repo, Node.js slash quick, if you're interested in checking out the code. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, AKA Fishrock, another one of the uh, Node contributors, has been working for a while now on a newer, better streams API because uh, frankly, Nodes isn't very good. Um, it, there's a lot of overhead as associated with the streams like machinery. So especially if you're trying to get data from C code back up through JavaScript and then also going through the streams API, there's, there's a lot of overhead. So there's been some investigation there um, into you know, ways to improve that. And then we're also still talking about adding more promisified core modules. So right now the FS module and the DNS module have promise, promisified equivalents of the old callback ones. Um, we're still figuring out what some of those would look like, but we're hoping to add more of those into core. And then some important links for you know, Node.js consumers. If you found a bug or a feature, or, you, know, you want to request a feature, Node.js slash node on GitHub is the, the main core repo. Um, don't come there to ask general help questions. Your issue will just be migrated to Node.js slash help. So if you have any type of support question, like why does, why does node not work, that's where you probably want to go. Um, if you have a more focused, like, you know, this should work, but it's broken, or I would like to see this feature, that's when you would come to the core repo. Um, if you're curious about seeing the LTS release schedule and all the information surrounding that that I showed earlier, that repo is node.js slash release. And then uh, if you found a security issue, we have a not confusing at all way to report security bugs. If it's a security issue related to node core itself, then uh, we're going to go to hackerone.com slash node.js. Hackerone is a third party kind of uh, security bug triaging tool um, that, that we use. And uh, there's also a second one if you found security issues related to NPM modules in the ecosystem. That's going to be hackerone slash node.js dash ecosystem. And that is all I have. Um, have a good day and enjoy the rest of, well, the conference is over. Enjoy. The, the after party. <laughs> <laughs>